their manipulation of the ambiguities of visual culture to create ready-made objects of desire for an entirely new set of buyers back home and the curious choice of the technique that he employed, aqua tilt. So we have heard of watercolor, litho, but they choose aqua tilt. Why? So what I'm trying to, you know, map, you know, I'm trying to map Daniels within a real market, art market, how they provoke desire among the buyers and then try to go technical and try to collaborate, you know, the entire thing together. But I have to somehow, you know, tie them all together, if I could. In the 18th century, most of the artists trained at the Royal Academy of London painted landscapes either in the mode of Claude Lorraine, which is neoclassical since pertaining to Arcadian Golden Age, or Salvador Rosa, which is stark wastelands of bare crags and broken trees inhabited by bandits and hornets, or else follow the conventional scenes in English picturesque tradition described by the indefatigable William Gilpin. To the discomfort of the Royal Academy colleagues and the London critics, William Hodges, in his Select Views of India, remember, look at the title, Select Views of India Drawn on the Spot, so that's very, very important, Drawn on the Spot, and the date is 1780-1783, enhanced the aesthetics of landscape painting by expanding its scenic subjects to sublime settings that it discovered beyond traditional European ones. Based on in plain air sketches, Hodges created paintings and engravings of real, intensely colored Arcadia inhabited by living noble savages, because you might wish to use the term, in the exotic tropical plains that he traveled, the South Pacific Islands as the official artist on the second voyage of Captain Cook, and India as a professional landscape artist patronized by none other than General Warren Hastings. After encountering unexpected and novel sights in strange lands, Hodges looked for scenes to paint that possessed a quality which he will term with a word, and that word is singularity. Okay? Singularity, which he actually associated with the conventional definition of the sublime. Of the Indian prospect, he says, and I'm quoting from his pieces, the appearance formed scene a, a form by the scene is highly gratifying to the mind, entirely new to an European, a singular variety, and even sublime. And he selects views that provide that kind of unexpected, within quote, singular experience. Following Hodges' lead, Thomas Daniel, accompanied by his nephew William, traveled to England and created six portfolios of aquatics. Oriental scenery. I'll be, I'll be concentrating a bit more on Oriental scenery. Thomas Daniel often expresses the idea of sublime singularity to be found in the Indian scene, and he chooses, like Hodges, artistic sites for the visually captivating effect that occurs when artifacts of varying ages and different cultures are found together, and then the artist can identify an unusual or unexpected feature in a composition to focus and distinguish an otherwise homogeneous scene. When Daniel was elected to the Royal Academy in 1797, he described the Indian subject of his diploma painting, Hindu temple in Bindrabond, Bindabond basically, as beautiful and singular. Indeed, singularity was the distinguishing compositional characteristics of the sites that Daniel selected for Oriental scenery. In fact, I'll just quote, that singularity would be sufficient apology for introducing the landscapes there, unquote. This is Daniel's own words. In fact, Turner, who was Daniel's, Turner, you all know of Turner, who was Daniel's great friend, he actually talked about Daniel in his own study, Liber Studio, which was actually based on Lorraine's uh, own work. But there he says, and I just quote, I want Liber Studio to be like Mr. Daniel's. Oriental scenery has succeeded in increasing our enjoyment by bringing scenes to our fireside too distant to visit and too singular to be imagined. So 
you can understand how we are trying to choose the subject in the first place. This obsession with singularity led artists like the Daniel to represent and repackage the exotic in Indian elements to a unique development curve. But this is also guided by the exigencies of the emergence of a new, what I call, fad of Indian taste, which became almost a favorite indulgence in the course there in England. By the end of the century, English designers were being sent to India to ensure that the objects for export would appeal to the home trade. Uh, one of the first major uh, printed reflections of the craze was this uh, book, uh, John Stocker's Theatres of Japan. Right? Look at the title. Japaning is actually a favored term which actually refers to the actual process of lacquery. Okay? Uh, and there, although the author in his preface praises Japan, as nature's darling and favorite of God, he actually goes on to say, our design is only to imitate genuine Indian work. So, you know, somehow I think, you know, uh, the word Indian uh, became more or less generic for anything traveling from the East, although it may come from Japan or China, you know, the word Indian somehow made its mark there. In Joshua Reynolds, again, a mathematician during that time, this goes uh, to the Academy, 1786, that is close together. It's a sarcastic hint of things to come. I'll quote, Whatever building brings to our remembrance ancient customs and manners is sure to give delight. Note the word, the barbaric splendor of those Asiatic buildings, which are now being published by a member of this Academy, with hints of composition and general effect, could not have otherwise occurred. Now remember, this is a direct reference to Hodges, because you know Hodges was actually doing this in select views of India. He was also a member of an academy, and he's trying to expand things, which is completely out of the comfort zone of the academy. A member of the British artist made quite posh voice to this dream world of wealth and raja, the painter Johann Jopani. Jopani, you can see Jopani in Victorian Indian as well, went in 1783, and he quoted uh, about Taj Mahal. I just want to give the quote. Interesting. It wanted nothing but a dome of glass of sufficient magnitude to cover and protect it. Many, in fact, the next one, which I think is very interesting, is uh, Robert H. Coldbrook's 12 views of the places in the kingdom of Mysore, the country of Tipu Sultan, from the drawings taken on the spot in 1793. Again, look at the word taken on the spot. So, you know, that is also being referred to here. It is then important to talk about Daniel's own negotiation with England by poring over their story of travel across the land, which in itself is fascinating. One constant endeavor is his engagement about his engagement with India is his constant search for what I call material value for his art. Because he was not very well off in England and actually he made the trip in order to you know also gain material. That's very important for every artist. In 1773, Thomas Daniel only, was only earning a modest living in London as a portrait painter, landscape artist and engraver. In, 19, in 1784, he applied to the East India Company for the permission to visit as an engraver. He was accompanied by William, uh, his nephew, for whose uh, upbringing he was responsible. The two Daniels actually first arrived in Calcutta in 1786 through a slow and roundabout way to, uh, via China. In the two years that followed, 1786, 1787, 1788, they created a set of 12 aquatics, which are called views of Calcutta. You can get it uh, from the Victoria Memorial College there. You know, they were not satisfied with the output, but the series was successful enough for the Daniels to plan two more tours. And one tour is actually, you know, that involves the northern India. They actually traveled as far as Garwal. I don't know anybody has actually painted Garwal the way they have done before the Daniels. And yes, yeah. And they actually went back from Garwal because there was a you know, threat of the good car invading and all that. They don't, didn't want to get, get it into the war situation and all that, so they just came back. And, uh, and remember, they are also fascinated in the northern, you know, detour. They are very fascinated by Mughal architecture, by Fort of Allahabad, by John Poo, you know, by Bihar. You know, Bihar features in extensively, they call it Bahar. You know, in, 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 in the paintings, which we, we can see some of them. In fact, they came back to Lucknow in order to get the patronage of the Naba because they have heard good things from Jopani and, of course, another person at uh, uh, I think. But the Naba rejected. So, you know, faced with the rejection, they had nothing, they had to come back to Calcutta. They came back to Calcutta. But, you know, after a stay of four months, they again made a grand tour through the southern part. Now, so they sort of traverse the, you know, length of the country, and they were also going to see known, for example, right? So that's again another interesting thing to note. Uh, 
ship to Bombay, they also actually explored the caves of Salset, Elephanta, and of course Elor. So you can see some of the paintings which I have, which will show those uh, in their unique style. Now, how do the Donniers work? That is very, very important. I want, uh, I'll, I'll show you the pictures, but let me tell you how they work. It's a very elaborate process, but let me be very, very short. The Daniel's custom in these journeys was to make numerous rapid drawings in pencil, pen and ink, wash or watercolor. They used the technique of the day, a pencil outline followed by a monochrome wash on which the color was laid. The hundreds of sketches done by the artist formed a vast stock of vivid and accurate observations which could later be washed up into finished watercolors, oil paintings or engravings. At first, Thomas, the elder one, did all the drawings and William did the mechanical task like using camera obscure for accuracy in perspective and also preparing paper and applying tack washes. However, by 1790, William was uh, good enough to do his own stuff. In fact, William became more popular later because he also did landscapes about Great Britain. Uh, it's a different story. Now, the stock of drawings used by the Daniels for no was used by Daniels for a number of purposes. After arriving in England in 1794, so they arrived in England in 17. 94, they spent 13 years, 13 years in making 144 aquatives. And if you see them uh, in the original, they are amazing. And they call it the Oriental Scenery, which was published in six parts between 1795 and 1808 and cost, you know, a whopping 210 pounds a set, which was, you know, quite a number, you know, by the For many amateur artists, these pictures were models of the picturesque to which they aspired. Now, Thomas was fully aware of this cult of pictures, for he is prefaced to a later book, which is called A Picturesque Voice to China, to India by China, he writes and quote, it remains for the artist, a very interesting quote, a very interesting quote, it remains for the artist to take part in this guiltless foliation, plunder, right, foliation, and to transport to Europe the beauties of these favored regions. Okay? Unquote. It is to be noted that Unter Price's essay on the pictures was published in 1794, that's actually the year the Daniels returned to England, and the Indie Festival William Gilpin was producing his sketching guide between 1782 and 1805. All the paradigmatic elements mentioned in the book regarding the pictures can be found in Daniel Will Show. Actually, you know, the crumbling ruins, the middle part holding the distance, the broken, you know, the foliage, the broken tree trunks, the foliage, everything that contributed to the whole part of the picture. Now, these books, like the other prints and the paintings exhibited at the Royal Academy, had the cumulative character of something very different, which I want to show you. Turner, there's a quote by Turner, again from Liberty to Europe, the East was as clearly reflected as the moon in a lake. Uh, by, that is his quote, by 1800, Thomas Daniel had actually designed an Indian temple uh, in an estate of Sir John Osborne. The estate is called Belchet. I will show you the picture. It is a very common one. And William Daniel made a prompt aquatic of it, which I can show actually. Not the main building, but aquatic. And also, if you actually look at that, you can think that it is not an English landscape at all. You know, it is something that is directly out from Oriental Scenery, you will see that. In 1803, and this is a very important thing, the Prince of Wales engaged William Borden to build new stables and a rotunda behind his modest classical villa in Brighton. The Indian style was selected and the design based in part on Daniel's Prince of Buildings in Agra and Delhi. From the Brighton, you can move to uh, other places like Sir Charles Cockerell created Cezin Court, again, a very Indian kind of villa for his second wife. Okay, and Cockerell's example is very interesting. Who was the team working for Cockerell? Let's get to the team. His brother, Samuel Pepys Cockerell, architect and surveyor to the East India House. Humphrey Repton, the famous landscape gardener, as we know, and Thomas Daniel, whom he had known in India. They created an extraordinary ensemble, including, besides the large manor house, Indian fountains, cows, for the windows and more routine temple, bridge, pool, whatever. They also planted tropical plants like bamboo, you know, again, very Chinese import, but you don't know what is Indian, what is other than the The design for the main house was loosely based on the mausoleum of Hyder Ali Khan in Lalbagh, first published in Colebrook's, you know, The Views of Mysore, and then again by Daniel in his Oriental scenery. I just quote Humphrey Repton uh, here. It's a quote from 18. 
accuracy. We are on the eve of some great change in landscape gardening and architecture as a consequence of, of our having lately become better acquainted with the scenery and buildings in the interior provinces of India. And this is something that we really welcome. But however, you know, in fact, the director wanted to uh, enlarge the pavilion uh, as well in Brighton. That could be carried out due to you know, lack of funds. But he actually produced something very interesting. Called, it's an important series called the designs for the pavilion of Brighton, out of which I will show you one uh, you know, spread, which you can actually see it absolutely like the Hazar Ali, you know, the monument that, he, that you know, Daniel saw. Okay. And now the work was not limited to architecture. That's very easily understand also the landscape gardening. Things as diverse as fabric, fountains, playing cards, and shop fronts that design is a test of what we call Indianness. It can be clearly seen that an upward mobile food viewer sought to distinguish themselves from the old elite in a way through this new encounter and engagement with art, architecture, and garden. They found their regiment objects of desire in the work of Daniel and the comforting picture of an exotic location owned, domesticated, and appropriated by them. I'll just show you the pictures very quickly and then just add a technical point before ending. This is actually Metra, new Metra. Uh, one thing that I find, it, find very interesting in Daniel is the way he breaks up the composition, you know, negative space, the way he uses negative space, the way, uh, you know, the negative space somehow, you know, dominates. Uh, more than what is there, you know, what is not there is more important than what is really there. So that is there. Uh, we can just go on. Uh, this is, of course, Tanjore, again, a very famous one. I have the 144, I have only selected 14. We can just go on. One of the interesting things in the painting of Aqua Tint is the depiction of foliage. This is the Juma Masjid, again, a very popular one, very known one. Uh, uh, okay, this is uh, Ilhabad, Fort of Ilhabad. Okay, uh, look at the way the foliage has been, you know, done. Because if you see the, uh, just a moment, if you see the foliage done uh, by you know, Daniel later in his, you know, tour of uh, aquatint on Britain, they are completely different, absolutely different from each other. And I think aquatint, I just go through the process of the aquatint in order to make you understand why he chose aquatint in the first place. Next one, this is actually, yeah, uh, this is actually the sunset. Uh, and the one I really like, next one, okay, this is cheap food, uh, how different it was, uh, you cannot walk now. This is the council house, okay, Calcutta, one of the first, and this is Rikers building, I just kept it, you know, for memory sake. And this is called the city of Patna by the Ganges, and uh, the Taj Mahal. Uh, very interesting is the way Taj Mahal is not in the middle, of course, uh, and uh, very rarely, you know, Jufani, of course, does Taj Mahal stand in the middle, you know, he just you know, separates it. Very interesting. So there's a different dynamic to that. I can actually talk about the way he negotiated Mughal architecture in a different way. Very, very interesting. And this is, of course, uh, in Dio Bahar. Bahar is Bihar, of course. Uh, you know, it's a Hindu temple. Yeah, that is the title of the painting. This is very interesting. A view of the Fakir Rock in Sultan Ganj. Again, it's Bihar. Uh, look at the way the cracks and everything, you know, uh, it points out. Very big uh, picture, very William Gilbert, you know. And uh, then, uh, can I have next one? Uh, this is beautiful. Uh, uh, you know, just to have a, uh, this is elephant, uh, the, the entrance to the elephant. But there's a clue, right? There's a clue. Uh, that is something that I'll explain now. I'll just take five minutes and just complete the paper. This is again uh, Bihar. Uh, Temple and let's go. Yeah, this is something from the from the England landscape. So you can find any difference. This, well, this, this would have been in India as well, right? This was designed by Daniel. Next one. This is the Brighton. You know, this was the design for the you know for the Great Pavilion, which was never actually that's never materialized. But you can see in the design, it looks uncannily like that you are in India. So you just transport the whole India there. Last word is about aquatic. You know, there's of course very attractive process. Uh, I don't know whether I'll be, let me, let me explain the first thing to me. The first step in the process of aquatic engraving is to lay the ground or grain upon a highly polished copper plate. To get this grain, it is necessary to cover minute portion of the plate so that these are protected from the acid bath, aquapotis, and only the intervening space be affected by it. But the space to be bitten by the acid must lie so close together that they cannot be detected by the naked eye. The acid will attack the spaces that separate the particles deposited, and when the plate is inked and printed form, they will appear as tiny white spaces into which the ink has not penetrated. I'll just show you 
not there. So that is the resin ground or the dust ground. Go to go uh, uh, to a more uh, this is a better one. This is a close up again. Uh, look at the white dot. That is where the paint has not attacked. That's the resin background. So if you are a printer, we do it regularly, but you know that is how we actually create something out of nothing. You know, the negative space, all this is not visible, is very, very important here. You know, the white dots, without that white dot, it's almost impossible to get that effect, the close. The next one, look at this. Even in figures, you can see the dots, the way it has been done. And the last one, ah, look at this. This is a more, I can get more close-ups, but you know, if you just go closer, you can see the white dots, you know, coming to play. Now, and just the last point before I end, why should we create an image with aqua tint rather than the that we are building Aqua tint distinguishes itself from other processes by delivering a range of tones that vary not only in value but in thickness. And thickness is very important for a painter, I can tell you that. The darkest areas have a thicker layer of ink than the light areas. Under most circumstances, the grays created through this technique have an underlying sparkle from the original plate surface. So the original plate is copper, that sparkle will come out. So it will give a kind of halo, a kind of a glow, which normally, in normal case, will not get in a watercolor, for example. So it is not like paper or in other media. It's a subtle glow that can be found only in this medium. It came into uh, origin during the Baroque period, of course. But like other techniques, it's a very important thing. The artist can actually reward the area. So there is also uh, a kind of provision to reward. So you can actually change. And I can show you there are many paintings where, you know, the diamonds have changed the composition. So for them, aquatic becomes the easy medium to change, to transpose, you know, to, to collate things which are not there in the original idea. And this is, of course, related to a lot of drama. The tone creates a lot of drama. And I end it because India, as such, is, you know, looked upon as a spectacle. And I just put something at it. Thank you for giving me this one. Uh, I'll tell you, this is Hodges, and what does Hodges say? Quote, uh, the intimate connection which has so long subsisted between this country and the continent of India naturally renders every Englishman deeply interested in all water, all that relates to the water of a globe, which has been a theater of things, highly important to this country. Hodges implicitly draws all Englishmen into an audience circle. They all view the spectacle of India glowing, unfolding on the stage. The complicity between the spectator and the event is made explicit when what is referred to the interest in India natural. And of course, slides also regarded as the hero of the grand oriental drama. You know, so that drama imagery is there. So in a way, aqua tint is also symbolic of the reticulated tonality, the minute networks of Christmas marks, you know, strewn across the ground, the body, the art, space, whatever it may be, would begin the marker of colonial discourse about the East, both in terms of appropriations and we can say of resistance. But that's another.